I want to start off by telling you a story. I was about 10 or 11 years old the very first time I ever ran in a race. It was this race in the middle of the summer, I think around the 4th of July, and my grandmother did this race every single summer and she would train year round for this and I loved going to my grandmother's house every other weekend because on Friday night I got to train with her. Um, we, we would walk anywhere between two to five miles as she would get ready for this race. And then she asked me if I wanted to, to join the race. I was like, absolutely. And so I'm like 10 or 11 years old, the first time I do a race. And I, it's like this 5K race. And I remember it took me about 55 minutes. I was just under an hour when I crossed that finish line. And I was like really excited, one, that I finished. But then I got really depressed because I'm like, I'm much closer to last place than I am first place, even in my own age group in the race overall. And so the next year it came around, I got to do the race again and I did better. I finished in about 45 minutes. And so I was really excited. And then the next year came and I overslept and I missed the race and then I missed the next year. And that was the last time I did a race until about five or six years ago when I did a 5k um, when I was at Galilee and, and I did that 5k. I finished in about 40 minutes. I was super excited with myself. But how many of you guys have ever ran a race? I bet most of you have, whether it was a 5K or a 10K, maybe it was a 50 yard dash or a race against your brother or sister to the car. Chances are most of you have been in some sort of race. Now, in my experience, people generally have a strong opinion about running. In fact, when it comes to competing in a race that involves running, I'd say that most people fall within one of two categories. Uh, either they absolutely love it or they hate it so much they wouldn't even run from a scary clown. Me personally, I hate running for exercise, but I love running when I'm competing against something like playing softball or basketball. If you hate running, I get it. Trust me. I mean... I get it. But here's the thing. Just in the U.S., over 60 million people love to run. Some of you watching this video are on the track or cross-country teams when, when school is in session in a normal school year. And you choose to run in your free time. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe you love the thrill of competing in a sport that only depends on you. Maybe you love the feeling of beating your personal best time. But I think there's a universal reason why running is appealing to a lot of people. It's not complicated. Listen, you may never understand all the rules of football, but everybody knows how running works. A 5K race is the same as a 10K race, which is the same as a half marathon, which is the same as a full marathon, which is the same as a race against your best friend to the gas station. The goal is always, always beat other people to the finish line. That's why running is so great for a lot of people. Winning isn't complicated. And that's, the, and that's kind of nice because the rest of life doesn't really work that way. And here's what I mean. What if I asked you, what would it take for you to be winning with your parents? How would you answer that question? There's no easy answer because your parents and your step parents probably want a lot of things for you. There's probably more than just that one goal. They want you to listen to them. They want you to do well in school, to make wise choices, to pick great friends, to do your homework. All right. To put down your food during dinner. Unlike running a race against other people, there's no clear finish line. You just keep running. Now, what if I asked you, what does it look like to be winning in the friends department? What would you have to do for all your friendships to be in a good place? Maybe for some of you uh, and, and your friends, the goal is that you would be there for them whenever they need you and answering every single one of their texts and like and comment on every single one of their social posts. 
Maybe it would be to support them if they're going through a rough patch. Maybe it's taking their side and defending them if someone's throwing shade their way. Basically with friends or parents or basically any relationship for that matter, winning isn't easy. There's no clear path and there's no clear finish line. And nearly everybody wants something different from you. One more question. What if I asked you, what would it look like to be winning in the faith department? What does God want from you? I mean, that's the ultimate question, right? Maybe you think, maybe for you, you think that it's, it's doing more right than wrong. Maybe it's going to church more or in today's world, watching more digital services. Maybe for you is to quit being angry as much or for you to become more patient. Maybe it's for you to stop looking at porn or smoking or drinking or whatever that bad thing is that's in your life. Maybe for you is to volunteer at something. Maybe it's to go on a mission trip. Maybe for you is to pray more and read the Bible more. In fact, some of you may be thinking, there are probably a lot of things I don't even know about that I should be doing. When it comes to our relationships with God, it's easy to feel like winning is impossible. Like we're running, but there's no finish line. And maybe some of you have reached a point where all this stuff seems overwhelming. I mean, you, you come to church, or in this case, you're watching the church services. You hear about all the stuff that God expects of you, and you're exhausted just thinking about it. In fact, maybe it's gotten to a point where, where you've thought about giving up. Or if some of you are being honest, you have given up. For you, the chase is over. It's not that you've stopped believing. You've just stopped trying so hard. It's too much to try to chase down all the stuff to make God happy. If you've ever felt this way or you're, you're feeling that way right now, I want you to know there's nothing wrong with you. I know that I've been there before and so has every single leader here at Antioch Christian Church and in the Antioch Student Ministry. Anyone who has ever walked with God for a while has probably reached a point where they were tired of feeling like they don't measure up that, to what God wants. And it seems so much easier to just give up the chase. And the whole thing makes me, makes me ask myself, and maybe you want to ask yourself this as well, is this really what God wants? To make faith so difficult that only the elite make it. To make chasing after him so exhausting that more than half of us just want to give up? Or is it possible that we have misunderstood what it looks like to chase him entirely? And that's what we're talking about tonight. To unpack this, we're going to look at a story, one of my favorite stories uh, from the book of Luke. And before we go forward, I want you to understand something about the book of Luke. It's not actually a book. It's more like an investigative report put together by a doctor. Now, in ancient times, uh, who interviewed people, who uh, uh, doctors who interviewed people, and, and this particular person, Luke, um, interviewed people that knew Jesus personally. Luke was a doctor who wrote down his findings, and this included in the Bible. And in this particular passage, Luke's write, Luke writes about a moment when Jesus visited two of his closest friends and disciples, uh, two sisters named Mary and Martha. Now, this particular culture, when someone visited your home, it was a big deal. You know how your mom goes crazy cleaning the house right before relatives visit? I mean, let's be honest, we can clean the house better in five minutes before somebody shows up than in the hour leading up to that. Well, take that idea and amp it up by several notches. At this time in history, hospitality was king. And if anyone came to visit, you made sure that, that they were comfortable, that they were well-fed, and that they had a great place to sleep. 
So you can imagine how much more important hospitality is if a VIP came to your house. And needless to say, Jesus was the VIP. So for Jesus to come and visit Mary and Martha, it was a big deal. There was a lot to do to get ready for him. And it's not like Mary and Martha had a staff of caterers and cleaners and party planners to help them with the preparations. As far as we know, the responsibility for getting things ready was on them. But as we're about to see, two people handle the same situation very differently. So I'm going to read tonight from Luke chapter 10 to start off with uh, verse 38 and 40. And this is what it says. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner that she was preparing. So Martha was apparently doing all the work. All right. She was making things perfect for the guest of honor. But instead of helping with the work, Mary decided to kick back to listen to Jesus and leave all the work for her sister. So Martha's upset at this point, and rightfully so. In her mind, Jesus deserved their hospitality. And wouldn't it be dishonoring him if they didn't work hard to take care of him? And feed him. So while Martha uh, does literally all the things, Mary just sits around, hangs with Jesus, and finally Martha's had it. She is fed up and she takes her complaint to the guest on. This is what it says next in verse 40. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. She's basically saying, Jesus, don't you care that I'm doing all this by myself and Mary is doing nothing? Tell her to get up and start working. After all, we're trying to do all this for you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that passage, in my head, I imagine Jesus responding a couple of different ways. The first one is this. Oh my gosh, Martha, you're being such an annoying tattletale. Or I can also imagine Jesus responding the same way that I would to my kids or that my dad responded to, to me and my brother when we were younger. He probably said, you know what? You're right. Mary, why don't you go and help your sister out? It's only fair that you do your share of the work. But here's how he responds. Check this out. Open my Bible again. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, why are you worried and upset over all these details? There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, this response is surprising. I mean, he doesn't roll his eyes and say, man, lighten up, Martha. He calls her my dear Martha. He adores her. But at the same time, he says the exact opposite of what she's thinking. She says, he basically says that, hey, your sister is actually getting it right. Basically, Jesus is like, Martha, Mary is actually chasing the right thing. She is chasing a relationship with me. You see, Mary, Mary understood the point wasn't to work for Jesus. It was to be with Jesus. And the reality is, as church people, as God's people, as people who rem are remotely interested in faith, we can get caught up in the exact same race as Martha. We want to please God. We want to get things just right for him. We try to work hard so that our life is a, a place that's deserving of his presence. In other words, our goal is to have the right behavior. We chase performance. 
But here, Jesus is basically saying, it's not about getting everything right for me. It's about simply being with me. And this is the huge truth that can transform how you see God. So let me put it this way. Chasing Jesus means not chasing performance. Now let's be real. It's not like Jesus is saying that, that goals are bad. He's not saying work is unimportant. He's not telling us to just throw away responsibility or go crazy and sin as much as possible. But when it comes to our relationship with him, working harder, performing better, and accomplishing more are not how we chase after that relationship. Perfect performance isn't required to be okay with God. Our performance with Jesus doesn't even have a finish line. The point isn't chasing after a set of rules or goals or expectations. The point is to chase after him. Now, Jesus never bases his love for you on how well you perform or you fail to perform. The ultimate prize is simply a relationship with him. It's not about him, not about the work that we do for him. Like Martha, you and I, we, we all get caught up thinking that God will love us more if we do more for him. But Jesus wanted Martha to know, and he wants you and I to know the simple truth, that his love for us is based on his decisions to love us in spite of our performance. That kind of love and that kind of relationship is better because it can never be taken away. Unconditional, endless relationships are ones that are based on love, period. And that love is never connected to how much someone deserves it or has earned it. And that's the right kind of love that Jesus has for each and every one of us right now. This means that we can stop worrying. It means that we can stop feeling guilty all the time. It means that we don't have to skip church or keep our distance from God when we feel like we've messed up. It means that we don't have to be exhausted worrying about how God feels about us. It means that just like Mary, we can simply rest and spend time with him. This week, I want to encourage you to change what you are chasing. The first one is this. Stop chasing perfection. The second one, stop chasing religion. And the third one, stop chasing sky high expectations. Instead, I want you to simply just do this. Chase Jesus. You see, Mary understood a fundamental truth. We don't have to get ready before Jesus will spend time with us. We don't have to get our life in order before he'll be in our presence. We don't have to do, uh, we don't have to, to be good enough to be good with him. Jesus was good enough for all of us. And he welcomes us because he wants to be close to us now. And nothing you or I can do or don't do will ever change that reality. When it comes to chasing Jesus, it may be easier than you think. He isn't running from you, telling you to catch up. He is running towards you. So don't get distracted. Don't complicate your relationship with him. All of us should strive to do good things, to serve others, to develop habits that grow us in our relationship with Jesus. You see, we will never grow if we stay the same. But none of that is a requirement to have a relationship with Jesus. And none of it will keep us away from him. When it comes to chasing Jesus, perfect performance it's not required. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for, for loving us, 
I know I say this every single week, but I mean it. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for the reminder to not get distracted with the things that are all around us and just keep our focus on you, that we should chase after you and not trying to be this perfect being that we cannot be. Father, I ask that um, you, you put this message on the hearts of everybody who's watching it right now, Lord. Let them have a desire to chase you and to stop chasing things because it's more important to be with you than anything else, Lord. I ask all these things in your son's precious name, I pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for spending another digital Sunday night thirst. Um, we're, hey, we're one week closer to being all back together, and, and that's awesome. When that time is, I don't know, but I am looking forward to it. So until then, make sure you guys check us out on Zoom this Wednesday night. We'll have another small group Bible study that is actually about this very topic as we continue the, this conversation called The Chase over the next few weeks, all right? Peace and love to you guys, and I'll see you very soon.